Hi, this is Justina Ireland, and you're listening to the FSF Podcast. All right, uh, here we go. Three, that's not three, that's one. Three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the FSF Podcast. I'm Tim. I'm your host, and this, of course, is my buddy, Ben, my co-host. We're here today with our guest, who is a New York Times bestselling author and a bookish bon vivant with a strong commitment to elevating marginalized voices. No, I did not write that. I stole that from her website. And I'll let you look up bon vivant because I had to. <laughs> uh, I grew my vocabulary. Do something for yourself today. I got smarters. Anyway, our guest is the author of books like out of the shadows and a test of courage for star wars the high republic era she's written dread nation deathless divide rust in the root and well that's just like the tip of the iceberg of all the things that she's written there's a whole lot of other books out there that if you haven't read them already you're gonna want to check them out and just i'm so stinking excited to welcome justina ireland to the fsf podcast welcome to the show justina oh good to be here yay yay <laughs> she said it was good very well, excited for this interview. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we've been, we've been talking about this for a few days. Where uh, I'm actually listening. I just started listening to uh, Out of the Shadows on uh, Audible. I'm not. I'm not a. I used to be a big reader when I was a kid. Now I I like listening to books while I'm do out doing things while I'm driving while I'm uh, especially Star Wars books because they typically have really cool soundtracks and it's like mm -hmm. a totally immersive experience uh when you listen to them so I, I really dig that um so yeah so that's where i'm at with my my book knowledge of justina ireland i'm in the out of the shadows uh but so out of the gate one of the first things that i i, I love to do and so first things first i love a good story i love finding out what makes people tick who why they are who they are what you know what kind of drives them i used to run another show called focused on forward where it you know we talked about people's how they you know overcame things in their life and how they you know moved forward and and those stories of of how people became who they are and do the things that they do kind of got drafted over into here a little bit in this one very simple question Justina Ireland, what influenced you to be the person you are today? What influenced you to become an author? I, so I didn't start writing seriously until much later in life. I think a lot of people, you know, they're like, when did you first start writing? They're like, when I was in elementary school, I read the story and gave it to my mom. And she said it was great and put it on the fridge. No, I didn't do that. Um, <laughs> like I was a big reader, but I also wasn't, I grew up in, uh, I grew up in Southern California. I grew up in a trailer park. So, you know, I grew up like very poor. Um, and we just weren't, we weren't the people who necessarily, that I thought we would be writers. Like, like the, when you see a writer on the back, you know, and it's like, you know, tweed patches on, just like patches right. on a tweed jacket and like a pipe or something. I like wrote that. a book, Muffer. Right. Yeah. Like, I wrote a book. And so it was never <laughs> one of those things like I thought I would do. And so, you know, I grew up um, after high school, I joined the army. I was in the army for around 10 years. And then um, I met my husband in the army. We got married. And then like, you know, life can continues on. I was working for the federal government. I had just had a kid and I was kind of like, I have no dreams. <laughs> just like the saddest thing to like, it's like all these things. I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Like I've done them all. And I was like, what do I do next? And my husband was like, you should write a book because you're always talking about like, I could write a better book than this, which is what a lot of people say. But then like when the rubber meets the road, it's like the reality is not true. And so I did. I, I wrote a book. It was terrible. I wrote another one. It was slightly better. And then I read The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins. And it sort of clicked because I realized I could write, <clears throat> excuse me, YA, but I could write books that didn't necessarily have to have all these things that other people's books had. Like I didn't have to write a murder mystery because you know, murder mysteries for me, they're very procedural and I kind of mm -hmm. hate writing mysteries because it just makes my brain go numb. And so that's, I wrote a book uh, called Vengeance Bound, came out, didn't do anything. Um, I wrote another book, Promise of Shadows, came out, didn't do anything. Um, and then I went to do an MFA because I was like, well, I gotta get better at this writing thing if I wanna keep doing this. And keep in mind, while all this time, I'm still working for the Department of the Navy. I'm writing policy. Like, and that, one of the things about okay. writing policy is nobody reads policy. Um, and so what I really wanted to do was just write stuff people were going to want to read, <laughs> which is what every writer wants to do. And that's kind of like what has made me who I am. Like, 
I just put all the things I want to see in books or I want to see in storytelling in my books. Like Out of the Shadows has a whole bunch of conversation about hyperspace philosophy because hyperspace is one of my favorite things about Star Wars. And I just want to know like, you know, what's the science behind it? What's the philosophical arguments behind it? What are the metaphysical arguments behind hyperspace? Like, how does it make people feel? And like, that is sort of like my philosophy is like when I sit down to write a book, I'm basically writing a book that I hope I want to read and hopefully other people want to read as well. Which, by the way, thank you so much for doing that. Because I am the nerd that's like, but why does it work? How does it work? And then I'm reading Out of the Shadows and I'm just like, it's all here. It's all here. There's astrophysics. <laughs> I'm Star yes, Wars. <laughs> science in my science fiction. But yeah, uh, so- it's yeah, it's dense. It's dense. I always apologize for that book because it is a little. It does get a little dense, and then I think if you're not like if that's not your your the thing you love about Star Wars, you're gonna be like eh. Like I mean, I also love the politics about Star Wars, and I know I see sometimes people are like, oh, this book was so heavy on politics. I'm like, but that's what makes it great is the politics, and so and I know not everybody else is like that. They're like, I like lightsaber battles. I'm like, well, I also like them too, but I like politics and then a lightsaber battle. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. Yeah, but politics are a huge portion of what Star Wars is. Oh, I know, but you will mm-hmm. see like people complain about the politics all the time. Yeah, I know, uh, but I was like, part of the Star Wars subreddit, and good heavens, you oh. mention politics in there, and they're just like, "Keep your politics out of my Star Wars." It's like yeah. that. Don't know. That is Star Wars, though. I mean, I understand keeping real life politics out of it, oh, but. Yeah. You know, but if you're going to if you're going to talk about Star Wars, you know, even from the very beginning, you know, when it's it's a political exercise, Mm -hmm. it's a political conversation. Even a new hope is is political, you know, in in how it's built and how it's made. And and then you go back to the prequels and you can't tell me that the that the Republic versus the Separatist was not political. And yeah, it's just. And I think, yeah, and I think that's one of the things that's always kind of like hard about writing an IP is that everybody brings like expectations with them. And so you have Mm -hmm. to like know what those are. And then you just write the story you want to read either because of those expectations or in spite of those expectations or, you know, whatever, like I am never going to write like a very, like I write with Tessa Gratton a lot of times and I'm never going to write a very flowery romance. Tessa is fantastic at that kind of stuff. Like you can write like, these scenes that are just basically people holding hands under flowery trees and stuff like that. And they're gorgeous and beautiful, but like, I'm like, no, we need to blow something up. Like, like, like this is like, this is like something there you go. Die right now. Like, cause this is so I, I do, like, I got like, great three pages of this. Now something that blows up, gets blown up. And so like, that's, I think just like, I think that's one of the nice things about the higher public is everyone's writing to their strengths. And like you have enough different kinds of books. Like if you don't like this one, that's okay because the next one you're is probably going to scratch the itch that you're looking for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, and you know, I think too. You know, in all honesty, you said you know everybody brings their expectations. I don't think that there's anything that you can write, whether you're putting in a novel or you're putting it or you're writing a screenplay for something that's going to go on the TV or something that's going to go on the big screen. Where somebody in Star Wars doesn't, you know, as as talking about the fandom, doesn't already have a preconceived idea of what it could and should be. And when it doesn't hit that, they're going to be pissed anyway. So just write what you want to write. And, you know, like you said, write the book that you want to read, because if you want to read it, chances are somebody else is going to want to read it, too. You know, Um, and so, yeah, I gave up on on uh, those folks a long time ago. (laughs) Uh. So you mentioned about writing like YA novels and things like that. Uh, and this is mainly a question from my ever so loving wife who has read basically everything you've done in the High Republic so far uh, really? and has been painfully and excitedly waiting for the new book to come out. But uh, so you've mentioned writing YA novels. What has been the most interesting thing uh, writing wise when it comes to going from middle grade to young adult in the high Republic. I will say that there really isn't any difference from middle grade to YA to adult. It's mostly just the size of the storytelling. So like, (laughs) 
And I know people have like very strong feelings about this category versus that. But the thing is, you have to remember, like when I was a kid, everything that was YA was being published as adult, right? A lot of your fantasy and sci-fi that would have been is now being published under the YA umbrella would have been published as adult because they have younger follow younger protagonists. And so like, it's mostly about like a lot of it's about the, you know, the, the journey, right? So a lot of times in middle grade, it's about characters figuring out where they fit in their community, like their local community, either with their group of friends or with their immediate. So like when we, you know, test of courage, it's really about, you know, Vernestra figuring out what it means to be a Jedi now that she's been promoted. It's where it's about Avon figuring out, you know, how to be this, this Senator's kid when she's kind of been sent away. It's about Emery figuring out how do I be, how do I become a, how am I a Padawan when my master has been killed? Like it's about figuring out like kind of like just your local kind of thing. When we get to YA, it's a little bigger. It's about figuring out where you belong in like the galaxy or like your community or who you want to be kind of thing. It's like, it's more about, you know, who am the person, who, who do I choose to be? And when you get to adult, it's really about dealing with those regrets from those previous two books, right? <laughs> it's like all those things. Like, when I was, when I was like, well, kid. Now I'm dealing with my regrets now that I'm an adult, right? I got baggage. And I got to deal with it. And so it's literally like on the page, the prose is the same. The characterization, the characters are different ages, right? So they, they might internalize and explain those feelings and emotions a little differently. But at the end of the day, it's mostly about the pace at which those realizations happen. Like middle grade, very short, condensed, in and out, not a lot of like subplots. We just got to kind of get characters to the goal. We talk about YA, you got a little more runway, you can have a little more of that introspection. And then when you get to adult, you know, you can have like a cast of 130 characters all having, <laughs> like, like when I first read the opening of Light of the Jedi, I was like, damn, Charles. <laughs> like, like, that was like, definitely an ordeal. Not that person, not that person, <laughs> like, you know? And so like, I think that's mostly the difference. Like we still, you know, people still die in middle grade. Sometimes most usually we try to kill them off screen unless it's like a very meaningful death. Um, people still die in, in the YA novels. Um, in YA, that's not um, Star Wars and not Disney adjacent. We usually have on page, you know, sex. Um, in Disney, they're a little bit more sensitive to that sort of thing, just because it is, you know, it is a brand thing. And I think that's it. It's like it's just about telling a good story. And the thing is, is like a good story when you're 10, 11, 12, should also still be a good story when you're 20, 21, 22. It should also be a good story when you're 30, 33, 34. And I think we know that because we think about those movies we love as a kid and then we watch them as adults. And sometimes we're like, ooh, this doesn't hold up because maybe it wasn't that great. <laughs> and then sometimes you're like, oh, this is still great. Like The Princess Bride is still a great movie, even now. I was just thinking about that. Yes. Thank you. It is a great movie, whether you are eight, whether you're 18 or whether you are 80. It is just a fantastic movie. It is timeless. And I think that's the thing about great stories is they are like a new hope was great when I was a kid. It's now right. I have some of uh, those moments now where I'm like, George, that was a choice. But like, it's still a great movie, right? Like, it is only I mean, that's what happens when you change the movie five times after it comes out. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, I, I think we're on the special, special, special editions or something. I, like that. I don't know. I, I just have Disney Plus, so I just watch them there. <laughs> it's <laughs> the special, 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 ultra exclusive limited edition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's coming yeah. in next week, so it'll be Which fine. Disney Plus changed the what was it the mcclunky mcclunky you know says and we where died. did that come from yeah i know when i first when everyone was talking about it i was like what are they talking about and it's it's the a matter of i've watched that movie so many times and i've seen that scene so many times that my brain just never heard it like it just mm -hmm. didn't hear when that happened like it's just what am i missing what happened so the uh, scene, go ahead you can go ahead ben in the in the disney plus version of a new hope when Han okay. shoots Greedo, it's the same thing of now they shoot at the same time. Han moves, but like right before they fire, Greedo goes McClunky and then they shoot. So it's like, yeah, we when no idea where it came from. Now you got to find your Greedo and find the McClunky. What's the McClunky? <laughs> well, now, now I want to get McClunky? on my... I've got it on DVD back over here, and I think I'm gonna pull that out and check it out. See if yeah, it's on I there. have. Oh, I've seen it on Disney Plus. 
seen it on the like ultimate special editions that came out uh right after revenge of the sith i also have it on vhs all of those movies are different yeah i'm like, gonna have to I, when we're done I here i'm pulling this one, out that's what i think the one i have and i do, don't believe it's mm -hmm. on there there's I, no mcclunky they added it just for disney plus i know this because i did a side by side because i have it bought on youtube as well Oh. That one does not have McClunky. What? Who is McClunky and why? <laughs> I. It's just kind of a debate. Maybe, uh, there, maybe it was like a, a background like painter who never got his like proper credit in the movie, and so they're just like, well, we'll just work it in somehow 30, 40 years later. It's fine. Mm -hmm. Or maybe that was like, uh, um, uh, you know, one of those really super cool replacement swear words. So instead of being like, son of a, he's like, a clunky. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing is like everything else Greedo says is like subtitled except for that. The clunky, yeah. Interesting. It might I did not like, know that was a thing. It might be like <laughs> the jeans and the Starbucks cup that was in, what was that, the end of The Mandalorian? What, what, which one, which show was that where they had, or was that, oh, it was Game of Thrones, right? Yeah, so where the, was, Daenerys was, had a Starbucks was, cup. Wasn't yeah. It, was just, uh, that was, uh, I don't remember the actor's name, the person who played Jon Snow. That was his Starbucks that he put in front of her, and yeah. she got the rap for that. I can't That's remember funny. who it was. I just remember it was, like, in frame, and somebody didn't, didn't check it out. Hmm. Back in the days, it was, as... when it was fun. <laughs> before, it was, before it was sad. R.I.P. Oh, boy. <laughs> as many times as I've watched Star... This is actually just blowing my mind at the moment. Um, yeah. Because many times, I, I mean, literally, I, I watch Star Wars chronologically all the way through from the very beginning to the very end. And I start back over again because that, that Star Wars is okay. life for me. I have a very, okay, then I have a question for you because my husband and I yeah. have already got this. Do you work the Clone Wars in or do you just watch the movie straight through and then go back to the Clone Wars and then Rebels? I watch the movie um, and then I go to the Clone Wars episodes and then I go and then after Clone Wars. Then I watch uh, uh, Revenge of the Sith, yeah. and then I watch Rebels, and then, you know, because I, otherwise it's too hard you, to to stop, you watch, pause, you know. Do you watch Rebels and then Rogue One, or do you watch Rogue One and then Rebels? Uh, Rebels, then Rogue One. Then Rogue One. Yeah, yeah. Because, because technically Rogue because One happens I, at the end of Rebels. Mm -hmm, yeah. And at the very beginning of New Hope. So, and... I love the fact it, we, we got to interview uh, Gary Witta, who is, you know, he's an amazing author, but also the uh, the co-writer of Rogue One. And I thanked him for the fact that I got that, that was the first Star Wars movie that I've ever gone to in this in the theater where I was like speeding on the way home because I had to complete the, the mm -hmm. frame in my mind of Leia taking that disc and, you know, and, and doing something with it. And, you know, and, and I, you know, I knew what scene was coming next and I just had to get that out of my head and, and you know, and visualize it. And so, yeah, uh, many speed laws were broken that night. <laughs> so, <laughs> Don't have yourself like that. <laughs> he he I, was I think, driving the speed limit. <laughs> yeah. I think the statute of limitations on a speeding ticket is, is over though. I think yeah, I was gonna say, it's been a few years. It's been a few years. But yeah, so I mean, well, and the only the only uh, uh, addition that I make to the Star Wars canon because I watch them all uh, in order is I add uh, the movie Fanboys at the very beginning before Phantom Menace <laughs> because it's because it's a movie about going to see the Phantom Menace, and so it, you know it just in my brain it works. That That's is. The only addition. So anyway, that's great. That's a brave that's admission, time. sir. <laughs> that's a great movie. I freaking love that movie. And there's rumor that that there's going to be a fanboys too uh, coming out eventually. And I'm like over here, just like you know, deep breathing into the paper bag, like oh, make it real, make it real. Is it so? That's a like a long split between two movies. Yeah, it would be. Yeah, I mean the split between in. The Incredibles one and two is like what fourteen years or something like that. Was it that long? That's pretty. Cool. But it's animated. It Those characters real. aren't going to age. 
I mean, if you want to get technical, there was a huge split between Fox and the Hound and Fox and the Hound too. But you know, whatever. <laughs> anyway, I I mean, Jay and Silent Bob, same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. So. And now a word from our show sponsor, Level Up Savers. Their link can be found in the show notes. the questions we had planned all oh, that's gonna get cut but that's fine no, that's okay <laughs> it'll stick around somewhere somehow uh so justina i was reading an interview you did in october of last year and golly i'll be darned if i, I forgot to write down the name of the magazine uh anyway it was an online magazine um and one of the questions you were talking with them about was the the, the worry of ai taking over and putting authors out of work and uh, you said, and I'm paraphrasing here, that good stories have nothing to fear, only serviceable writing has, has something to worry about. I was hoping that maybe you could expound on that a little bit more, especially since we've seen such drastic changes and increases in AI, even since October of 2023 to now February of 2024. Yeah, so um, I still think AI is still a huge threat. I do think AI is a threat, not because of the quality of the storytelling, but because when you talk about an industry that makes money off of storytelling. What people want is, I don't know if you've ever heard the term, you know, when you're doing a program, you can have good, fast, cheap, pick two. And right. what, mm -hmm. what people, what companies typically want is fast and cheap, right? Because they're just there to make money. So when you talk sure. about the publishing industry, when you talk about movies and television, you know, the people who are at the top making decisions don't really care about the artistic integrity of things. And that's not true wholesale. That's just for the most part, right? There are definitely studios who are putting out very artistic, and very interesting storytelling. But for the most part, you know, when you're on like, you know, episode 82 of Fast and Furious, like, you you know, at some point, <laughs> there's not a lot of thought going into it. But it's like, all about family. It's all about family. Yes, I know. <laughs> oh, sorry. I got to put my dentures in so I can see family. family. And jumping a car through a helicopter. Those are the two things. But that being said, when we talk about people and when you talk about storytelling, you talk about writing, especially good writing, good writing is almost always tied to the time period in which it's created, right? Like if we talk about horror or we talk about science fiction or we talk about like something like the history of the future, right? Because like um, – when we talk about the history of the future, we're talking about the golden age of sci-fi or what we used to call the golden age of sci-fi. Like when they were telling us what it was going to be like in the year 2000, the year 2020, it's sure. not like that, obviously it's very dated, but those emotions and that fear, like we didn't up until maybe three years ago, have a strong nuclear fear in this country anymore. Right. We had kind of put that by the wayside now with the war in Ukraine, that's kind of coming back around. But that being said, in the 50s and 60s, that was a prevalent fear for, for most Americans. Oh, sure. So that emotion, that, that emotionality, those fears are kind of seep into the prose of that storytelling. You can take all that stuff and create a story, but it's not necessarily going to resonate the same way somebody putting together a poster uh, through AI. Sometimes you're like, I don't, I don't get it. It's not, it's serviceable, but it's not speaking to me. It's not evoking that emotion. It's the same way with like the AI art. You know, we keep talking about AI making art, but the art it's making is is not anything that people are gonna. It's it's not it's not a Jackson Pollock. It's, it's not a Picasso. It's not something that you see and you're like, you have that moment. And I think real art and really great writing and really great storytelling gives you that kind of gut punch, that kind of like that immediate emotional connection. And nothing I've read that's AI has been anything close to what I read from a really great writer. And I think that's the that's the, the problem. Um, now there's a whole other bunch of problems there about, you know, like I've had several of my books taken to train AI. I didn't consent to that. Right. So that's my, mm -hmm. my, my stuff you're taking. And now, you know, that leads up mm. open some questions about who owns the copyright. Um, the United States court, you know, the court system has already come out and said, you can't copyright AI created materials, which is great, which means it's just going to always be public domain, which kind of, you know, takes off some of the 
the excitement about creating with it. But at the end of the day, like even if you have AI create the basis for a story, you're still going to have to have a human being interpret that back to people because uh, because the emotional journey of people is changing, right? The emotional journey of my my kid who, you know, was born in 2007 is very different than me that was, who was born in 1978. Like I got to see the internet become a thing. Like he's always lived with right. the internet. And so he has very different language and very different feelings about that. And I think that's what I mean by that. It's like, we have not yet <laughs> taught a machine how to feel. Now, when we mm-hmm. do that, we're kind of going to all be, you know, in big trouble <laughs> because that's when we get to judgment day. And then Alan Schwarzenegger is going to have to come from the future and save somebody. But all that being said, I think it's like, we're, I think we're still, we're still at that point where you can't fool a person who's paying attention with AI. And that's the biggest thing. It's like, you're just, the point of telling stories is kind of to teach us how to be humans and how it means, what it means to be human and how to like, we reconcile the worst parts of ourselves with the best parts of ourselves. And AI just ha- doesn't do that right now. It will tell you a very serviceable story. It'll get you from point A to point B. Sometimes not even that. Sometimes the stuff is a little sketchy. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah. And I think that's where, where I'm with it. Because I do think, you know, it just I think just two days ago, someone was like, oh, the chat GPT like crashed. And it was like, just, it was in that, you know, and we've all had that point, you know, like the telephone system crashed a couple of days ago, right? It's like, right. at some point, you know, like computer programs crash, but when people crash, it's like much different. It's, it's emotionally Mm -hmm. driven. And I think that's, I think that's for me, the biggest thing. It's like, they haven't, we have not yet taught people how to fully deal with their, their emotions. So how are we going to teach machines to fully deal with their emotions? Right. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Yeah. So that was a bit of a, like a comment. I'm sorry, but like, (laughs) no, no, I love it. No, that was a great answer. Honestly. Yeah. Everything you said was perfect. I, I've definitely noticed that where I'll see posts on Instagram or Reddit or Facebook or whatever and just be like, why does this feel off? Why am I not feeling anything from this? And then it dawns on me. I'm like, oh, it's AI. It's a lot of people will have flat out said that it's soulless. Yes. There's no emotion behind it. They just copy and paste, like ripping out other people's work and kind of making some kind of weird paper mache monster out of everyone else's jobs yeah and it's just so i mean i've dystopian i've used a couple of ai for a couple things but i've actually gone back through and edited what ai gave me so that i could put some life into it because i wasn't just sure how to word a couple things and i thought well you know i'll put this into chat gpt and see what it spits back out at me and i liked about 75 percent of it and I was like, that other 25% is where, you know, like Ben just said, soulless. That's where the soul was. And I was like, well, it doesn't have anything that resembles me because it's not how I would talk. It's not how I would write something, you know, in, in my voice. And so I wanted it to be in my voice. And so I made a few changes. Um, you know, the other thing is, and, and this was, uh, we have my my buddy over at the Scarif podcast, Ro, uh, was uh, putting something out today about his new profile picture and you were talking about AI art and he put out this profile picture that looks nothing like him. And so I used the same app and I put one out of, did one of me, according to AI, this is me. That looks nothing (laughs) like me. In the nine realms is that guy. (laughs) I don't know, but that's not me. So, that looks like- AI is cool, but I think there are some still some very strong limitations as to what it is and how it does. You know, That's- I haven't, you know, let's let, let's call a spade a spade. I have never really been a thin mint to begin with. <laughs> and I haven't been that dude since I was probably like, you know, uh, in high school. So that was maybe freshman Tim face there. But, you know, anything else has been a little, you know, extra large. Say. But I also it's think like, that photo is so generic, right? Oh, it like, is. Like that photo doesn't have like a lived experience. And you can tell it looks like generic comic guy number three, right? Like it looks like it. I mean, it's just, and that's the thing. It's like when you write, for example, like you're bringing your, 
your experiences. You're bringing your like, you have like a backpack of baggage with you that you carry everywhere, right? All your experiences, right. all your successes and your traumas and your failures, and embarrassments. And like you put Absolutely. that in language, like there are words that I would never use. And so like AI doesn't have that, right? It's just picking from everything. And there are words that I love that are in there all the time. You know, like the word juxtapose is like probably in more books than it should be. But I like that word. And so like- I Is think that it's, why? It's <laughs> I know that. Word. I'm like, wow. I think it's just such a great it's... way to say that instead of like when I compare the two items, it's like juxtapose is just like straight to the point. And there's a few so other. Yeah, but like so I quick, think it's quick... like that thing. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. No, was, no, I'm sorry. I was shutting up so you could talk. Um, because you know we brought you on to talk, not to hear me. Uh, but so a quick side note about how I how I discovered the word juxtapose. I'm like I discovered fun five oh, in the day, just like so. <laughs> Um, years ago, so one of my favorite singers and one of my favorite bands is Scott Weiland from Stone Temple Pilots, Scott mm -hmm. Weiland, who is now dead, but Scott Weiland, I absolutely love that man's voice. I mean, he could sing anything and it just, it was impressive to me, his range, but they were doing, uh, back when, uh, VH1 actually played music. Um, they played old people music, right? Remember they were like the older adult station and then MTV. That's right. And then here's right. The youth. So at... Yeah, exactly. So yes. at one time, MTV was doing Unplugged, mm -hmm. you know, and VH1 was doing something called Storytellers, where they would bring a band on and the band would sit down and they would talk about how they came up with these songs and everything, every, all these different things. And all of a sudden, he sa he was talking about um, their song called Sex and Violence and he, he, why he wrote it, because he liked the idea of the juxtaposition between those two. And I was like, juxtaposition? What? What the hell is that? <laughs> and I had to look it up and I learned a word and I got smarter. Um, so anyway, Don't thank work. you, Scott Weiland. You, you've all been right. using all kinds of vocab words today. You, <laughs> juxtaposed, expound. That, that's I'm, a big one. Hey, <laughs> you know, I didn't even have to get out the calendar for the word of the day. I'm pretty impressed with myself. <laughs> so. Oh, boy. Okay. Uh <laughs> So Back to our regular scheduled programming. <laughs> you mentioned before about Vern. Uh, yeah. Vern is a beloved character for pretty much everything you've been doing in the High Republic. Uh, honestly, my wife's favorite character. Because, yeah. to, to quote, Vern is so unbelievably cool. That's it. It's just, <laughs> that's her whole thing. It's just Vern is so cool. Looking at the pictures and of done. Vern, yeah, that's it. Uh, there's other words in there that I can't say on this program. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Uh, but what's been the most fun, but also the most painful thing about writing Vern's journey, whether it be through Test of Courage all the way up to the upcoming Defy the Storm? Maybe not giving spoilers for that last bit, though. Yeah, I mean, definitely the most fun has been taking this kid, this this character who I created from my 90s gifted kid angst and like giving them an entire story arc that has nothing to do with anything I've ever accomplished or achieved or lived through. And I think that sometimes like the best part of Star Wars is it gives us a place to like kind of like dream and imagine and stuff like that. I mean, because, like, Nick Vern's, you know, whole thing is, like, you got promoted too early, kid. Like, and, like, now all these bad things are happening in the galaxy, and you don't even get a chance to really settle into your job before you're being kind of thrust into the forefront. And so it's been really great to kind of tease that out and also kind of show that, like, I think a lot of times, like, especially when we talk about the prequels and just taking, like, if you just watch the films, especially for, like, those fans, the Jedi come across as really cold and unfeeling and like kind of like self-involved. Like, <laughs> like, which they are, but yeah. Right. Especially by the time of Phantom Menace, but like, like, like that, like when Qui-Gon tells Shmi like, well, better luck next life lady in slavery. Like it's just, it's just so, it's just, I don't know. It's just so bad. Right. And you're just like, you're like, Oh, and so being able to show that like the Jedi are not that way, like giving them depth and like, breadth and worries and concerns and things and people that they care for even though they're, they're not going to like you know put them ahead of like their beliefs and kind of stuff has been really great the 
like most anxiety inducing or worrisome thing about writing Vern is a hundred percent when I heard she was in an acolyte because I didn't know how she was going to change. Now I like, now I'm good. Like I've, I've, I've gotten like the back brief on that. And so it's kind of, it's pretty cool. Um, but like when that was first announced, I was like, Oh no. So like right when the high Republic was announced and this was when I saw on Twitter, someone looked at all like the concept art and didn't like Fern's concept art and then came up with like, what was like this hyper sexualized concept art for, for Vern. And it was like, it was like, basic anime made chick number two kind of thing and uh yeah, uh, yeah. and it, they do it all the time and like lower back problem girl yeah so, <laughs> it's, it's like it's all about the plot yeah right it's like these aren't breasts these are bowling balls like these are pinatas like it's just like this like this hyper those are the plots yes yeah those are, that is the only plot you need and it was like this outfit and it was just it was like kind of like dude she's 16 like, mm-hmm. <laughs> like that was like 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 that was like you know and i had that moment where i was like this isn't like that was like the realization i had where like oh this is going to be something that's totally bigger than me and i need to get okay with that so when i found out that, that Vern was in the acolyte i was kind of that was my my thing is like i hope that they they realize what people like about Vern and who Vern is as a character and they honored that instead of like filing off the serial numbers and, and creating mm. a different character who has nothing to do with the, you know, arc we've already established. And I think like, I think when people see Renesh Trump, like, you know, cause she's very, very grown up and they meet her in that space. I think they will recognize the character they've spent time with in the higher public. But I also think they're going to really like who she's become. And I think that's one of the nice things is that <laughs> the fear is always there that you're going to write a character and they're either going to get one, a terrible death. That's like almost like a, like a, a basically a bullet point. You're like, Oh, and then they died mm-hmm. off. Page. You're like, oh. yep. <laughs> and then the, t- the second thing is that they're going to do something wildly inappropriate. And like, I just think about that, like the hyper, everything. There's been a couple other ones of, of like the, mostly the uh, feminine or female characters of like the hyper sexualized stuff. And it's like, Bros, you can have ladies who are cool. <laughs> who are just yeah, kind of good at stuff without like having to make them fit like an unrealistic mold. Like it would be like if people took like the Stellan art or the Elzer art and made them like like bodybuilders and ripped and like it would also be inappropriate for who they are as characters. So yeah. Anyway, Wait, that's so my the two idea. things I find challenging with that is that so you know you're talking about the hypersexualization of of women. Um, well, a is a problem in a in of itself that's yeah. you know mm-hmm. like just let them be cool like you said just let them be cool they're they, they can be who they are um but you know that also happened with ahsoka yeah you know, mm-hmm. people the, the fan art and the hyper sexualization of her and i'm like dude she was like 14 yeah in, in the clone wars 14 and i can't tell you how happy i was during the ahsoka series when they did the flashbacks to the clone wars to not have her in that little tube top outfit that she had in the animated, yeah. you know, and just, I was so glad that they had that, that Disney, you know, went back and they fixed that for the live action. And I was like, thank you. You know, because, you know, not that, I mean, look, a woman can wear whatever she wants to wear. I'm, I'm not her boss. I can't tell her what to do, mm-hmm. but just because I also know how some dudes brains work or lack of function, uh you know the pretty lady needs to be less clothing anyway um you know and, and there's all of that and it's just so yeah and, but they also did that with ray from the the, the sequels yeah mm-hmm. and, and and the thing that cracked me up by that because we were talking about that you know you know the the um <clears throat> enhancements mm-hmm. <laughs> and i'm like and i'm like those weren't there in the movies guys i mean you're you're adding things yeah. on that were not I uh, I tried to show my kiddo weird science and the part where they're like programmed. <laughs> no, no. And he was like, "What is wrong with them?" <laughs> and that was the end of that movie. The, that movie experience. Where they're picking the breast size. The yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's yeah. Just like, and it's played for laughs, but it's like not that no, the, far from the truth. <laughs> yeah, not that far off from reality, especially with. Yeah a lot of 15 to 17 year old dudes. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that was Sad. Mimi's. So I'm glad that they got rid of the tube top and the flashbacks on Ahsoka because I do think it's like, we learned something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's exactly. 20 years, but we learned something. Actually, quick question, because I didn't realize that Vern was going to be an acolyte until like fairly recently. Mm-hmm. I'm assuming... I don't want to make any assumptions and I don't want you to break any NDAs that you might have, but how is that feeling having your character now in like more than just books, like visibly seen, but also not really being part of that? Cause I'm assuming you're not writing for Acolyte. No, no, I'm not writing for the TV show, but it's kind of a deal. Like, it's kind of what you sign up for. Like, that's why whenever I see, like, creators who, like, work on, like, Marvel characters or, like, Star Wars things, they get all mad about, like, how their characters are being used in a space or the storytelling that's happening. It's, like, it's in the contract, boys. Like, it's right there on the page. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> like it's, like, it's it's part and parcel of, of being able to sure. come to the party. Sure. Right? Yeah. So, that, it's, like, one of those things. It's, like, it's kind of one of those things. It's, like, you know it's always out there, but you're kind of hoping for the best. So, mm. Okay. Okay. All right. So as I mentioned earlier, I love following you on social media. I have had some nice hearty laughs uh, on your <laughs> posts. Um, I, I honestly, I'm laughing, and my wife's like, "What are you laughing?" I'm like, "Just Ireland. <laughs> um, uh, it's probably it's honestly some of my the most enjoyable content on Threads, in my opinion, uh, because you talk about a little bit of everything. It's not just, "Hey, here's my book. Here's my book. Here's my book." It, it's, I mean, there is some of that. Obviously, you know, that has yeah. to happen. There needs to be some shameless self-promotion. I'm no no stranger to that. Uh, but I also wanted to talk to you about that because you, you're really good at at promoting yourself, but you're also really good at just talking about stuff. Like yesterday, you put up a post about uh, playlists and how everything comes back to Foo Fighters and the song Everlong, which is true, by the way. It happens, yeah. uh, especially because Dave Grohl has, has played with everybody everywhere, at you know, somewhere. It's like he is, you're right, it's the six degrees of Kevin Bacon, but with Dave Grohl. Um, but yeah, but so I went I went from there, I went to your website, because I was like, oh, let's check out some stuff on our website. And I saw this heading that said, the hater raid. And I was like, yes, please. <laughs> and it said, it's going to be a blog. And yes. I did. <laughs> yeah. so, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're like blowing up a spot. Um, yeah, so <laughs> like, so I used to have, my, my newsletter was called The Haterade, and it was just pretty much, like, a, a roundup of whatever I had coming out. Because, like, at some point, like, there's just too much. Like, like between sure. my own stuff and, like, the Marvel comics and, like, the Star Wars books, it's just, like, there's a lot. And I'm, like, I can barely keep track of it. I don't expect anybody else to keep track of it. So it was part of that, and it was part just a newsletter. But then it used to – it was with Tiny Letter, and Tiny Letter folded, and it went under MailChimp. Right. I refuse to work with MailChimp because they're, they're monsters. And so then I went to Substack, and apparently they're monsters too, because Nazis. And so now right. I'm like – We're not going to shut down Nazis. Whoa. We think they should have created – yeah. I don't know yeah. any of these sites and just the sudden like – Oh, no. Nazis. Like, whoa, hang on. I know. It always ends up in Nazis. It's like, what is that rule – not rule 34, the other rule, whatever. It always ends up. Wow. That's a whole lot. <laughs> hey, so, rule you're 34 is a little different. Flash, <laughs> you're family friendly. Um, but like, a smidge but, different. <laughs> so like, Jeez. Like, I was, Tiny Letter was basically just a mail aggregation service. So it was basically just a fancy email. And so it saved me from having to do like, in the dark days of my first Y book, which came out in 2013, we had these email lists and you would like go into your Excel spreadsheet and copy the emails. And then you would put them in like a BCC line and you would send out your newsletter that way. And it always ended up that one, there was probably somebody on there who didn't want to be on the newsletter anymore. So then I had to go from like their email response back and try to figure out where they were on the Excel spreadsheet or two. There were people who were like, um, I don't want, um, I don't want this anymore. There are people who are just, you know, different weight. But anyway, so I went over to Tiny Letter and I was there for a long time and like I didn't, wasn't very regular. And then when I, literally the week I moved to Substack is when that article came out about um, the white supremacists having their newsletters on Substack and monetizing their stuff. And Substack was like, we're okay with Nazis. And I was like, oh my God. So I couldn't in good conscience go there. So I was like, what do I do now? And then my husband's like, I guess you're back to a blog. So I threw I threw it up on my website. I haven't done anything with it since because I've just been like posting some threads and, and Instagram. Since January seventh, I want to point out. 
Yeah, it's been, it's been really busy. It's been a really busy month and a half, Tim. Get off my back. <laughs> and so, and so that's like, that's what it's. So at some point there will be a blog there because when I have like longer things, I think about and usually about um, once every once in a while I'll get a uh, an email to my uh, my person my my public facing email about like a writing question or about you know, where can I find this thing or that thing? And then usually I, I just, if it's something I've gotten enough, I'll either put it on my frequently asked questions on my website or I'll put it, I'll write a post about it. And so I'm, it's yeah. probably going to be like a once a month, maybe every couple of weeks. Once I have like my feet back under me, I've been underwater for like the last like month. So fair enough. I just got excited because I was like, Oh, a blog. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>. please. <laughs> You are like, the only human on earth excited about a blog. Oh I even clicked me a heart. And my if wife you go to your are web... so excited about this. If you if you go to your website, I even clicked the little heart to like the fact that you were going to make a blog. That was me. That was me. I was the guy who clicked the heart. So yeah. Yeah. I, so I actually... Go ahead, sorry, oh, sorry. I was gonna say I actually found out about your blog because of my wife, who follows all your stuff because she loves your writing. And was we're, we're both super nostalgic nerdy 90s kids so the moment you came out with a blog again we're just like the ancient texts have been revived <laughs> wait till you see my live journal <laughs> oh, God. But like what happened to blogs like i know we're in just like this live service mm -hmm. media of like facebook and instagram and stuff but blogs were so good and they're just no one does them anymore i fell off of blogs when the rss feeds kind of became you know yeah. kind of wonky when it was hard to get like a good rss feed because if like for a long time you could just like subscribe to a bunch of blogs you could go to your rss reader and it was like all there and then stuff broke down i don't know blame squarespace i feel like squarespace ruined the websites forever <laughs> so. i'm solid with that we can do that <laughs> never gonna Damn get a sponsorship the man. from them but that's fine because <laughs> that's okay. that's you need a website <laughs> build oh, your own boy. go to whatever website yeah i use click right our now. link underneath the link the video <laughs> <laughs> okay site ground go to site ground that's where i built mine use wordpress it'll be much more gooder yeah okay so you've done more than just higher public you've mentioned your other books a couple times so let's go into a little bit about that yeah do you prefer writing standalone novels duologies or longer series of the like in your own settings or do you enjoy more being in kind of like a pre-created universe that you just have to fit into i like both but i honestly the um working doing ip like star wars stuff gives me the space to create my own stuff because it's the difference between building a playground so you can swing on some swings or just showing up to the playground and swinging on some swings and so like sometimes you're like I can build a better playground. I'm going to do that. And that's, you know, my books. And sometimes you build a playground and you're like, this was great, but I don't need to be here ever again. And that's, you know, a standalone. And then sometimes you're like, you build a playground and you're like, yeah, I'll come back and check, check it out, see what everyone's doing. And that's, you know, more of a series. But I really, really love, like, I know a lot of, there are a lot of authors who will tell you how much they hate IP. And for those who don't know, IP is intellectual property. It's when the characters mm -hmm. and the copyrights are owned by some, uh, another party. And there's all kinds of IP. There's like, we think about Disney and like the big franchises, but publishers have, you know, IP where they come up with the idea for a store and have an author write it. Um, there are production companies that have IP where they come up for an idea for a store and have an author write it. So like, there's lots of different kinds of places you can do that. And it's, it's nice because there is some IP where you create the world yourself and you do all that work. And that to me is always kind of like the least fun because you're doing all the work and yeah, you're getting paid, but you're not really getting getting any of the back end rewards. And so it's like, it's for me as like a, I'm a full-time author and that's, you know, something I, when I started publishing, I knew that was my goal. That was what I, that was my dream, the impossible dream. And so for me, it's a matter of like diversifying my portfolio because if I'm only writing one type of thing, like I write TV, but TV was on strike for half of the year last year. So if I only wrote TV, like I'd be like, you know, crying to my mortgage company right now. And so nice being able to diversify keeps me able to like eat and pay my bills and that kind of thing. So yeah, so I like both. It just really depends on my day. Some days it's like I'm writing the IP and I'm like so mad, I'm like just so angry at Star Wars. And I just <laughs> like, I have like the big encyclopedia. I'm just like turning the pages like angrily. And then some days I'm just like, oh, it's so great. 
I'm just so happy I don't have to work out these problems. Somebody else will fix it. So <laughs> that, That's one of those things that writing in like a pre-created universe can get so difficult. I read oh, what it was a extended universe story about the Clone Wars and they accidentally made Kit Fisto's lightsaber blue. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, everyone knows it's green. That author got ripped like 80 new ones by so many people just being like it's supposed to be green it's like the nerd rage was great that day <laughs> yeah. it was but then they also have so much of their i can't i can't remember the author i gotta find the, the book again but they have their own things as well that no one's had a problem with ever <laughs> yeah right yeah and, yeah. and that's and sometimes that stuff gets changed like you know you have a copy editor who is supposed to like who has all that stuff and sometimes you'll go in and you're like, wait, the copy editor changed things. This isn't right. And then it's like, you got to flag it, make sure everyone looks at it. And you're like, Hey, did this change? Especially with the higher public where everyone's writing at once, you know, you'd, you'd see things came back in copy edits and you're like, did we change this somewhere? Cause that's not what we had discussed. And then you realize like, Oh no, the copy editor ha like has it wrong or somebody else had like the wrong note down. And then like, you have to go or something okay. did change. And then yeah, you have to make sure everything realigns. So. A lot of moving pieces, okay. a lot of people to keep All right. in line. Very cool. Hmm. All right. This is our final question for you, Justina. Right. We call it our silly question. Now, we started asking these silly questions because we used to do a quiz at the end of the show, and, well, I got lazy. And, <laughs> uh, frankly, I just didn't have the time to always do the deep dive of information to try and come up with questions that people were just going to pummel the absolute living hell out of. We had Sam Witwer on the show. We did a quiz with him. He was answering the questions before we could ask them. It was pretty sad. Um, <laughs> but that's Sam. Uh, anyway, so we started asking the silly question. We used to ask a couple different ones. This is the one we've settled on for a while because we realized at a certain stage of life, people stop asking you this question. And frankly, we think that's also sad. So here it is. Justina Ireland, what's your favorite dinosaur? Um, this is so hard because it's a stegosaurus today, but sometimes it's a triceratops, and then sometimes it's just a T-Rex because you just need to tear things apart. Um, and I'll, let me just tell you, I'm a huge, huge dinosaur fan. I really am. <laughs> like, I am just like, if, if to, to the point where I embarrass my family, but like one of the first things I did when I had like an advance check that wasn't like tagged 100% for bills is I bought myself a Jurassic Park pinball machine because the T-Rex eats the pinball. And it is literally the shining joy in my life. And I know we're not supposed to assign value to material things, but it is my heart. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, I love it. Those days, sometimes a Triceratops, but a T-Rex is always a solid choice. Nice. I, I love I how dig it. I love how you have a kid, but the pinball machine is the light in your life. <laughs> Got you a know, loving, like, loving like, family, you, everything. You me? And I was like, depends on the day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as a father of three children, I totally get that. <laughs> you know, some days it's like, I love you. I will do anything. I will go to the, I would walk through the molten lava for you. And then other days it's like, could you just go talk with your mother? You're like, is it not your God bedtime? <laughs> But dad, it's only four in the afternoon. I don't care. Yeah. 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 This is why I, I have it. a dog. <laughs> Dogs are a solid choice. Uh, they're a solid choice. Children are also a joy, but yes. But oh yeah, awesome. love love them. They're great. They're, they're fantastic. People, and they come with all the problems that people come with. So love the the sudden little asterisk there, just like oh yeah. no, they're good. Yeah. I promise. No, no, yeah, they're all great. Right. <laughs> <laughs> love you, kid. <laughs> well. Christina, thank you so much for being on the show today. Uh, no where can our listeners go and find you and more about your work? Yeah, so you can always find my website, justinaireland.com. You can find me on Instagram as justina.ireland. I'm pretty sure Threads is the same, justina.ireland. Um, you can probably find me on Blue Sky, but don't hold your breath. Um, so that's probably mostly where you can find me. Um, and you can find my work wherever great books are sold. And if you like horror television, you can watch the latest show I worked on. The Fall of the House of Usher is on Netflix now. Oh, that's fantastic. Cool. Well, thank you so much. 
We'll make sure to put all those in the show notes below so our yeah, listeners so can check you out. <laughs> Yeah, check them out for sure. That's right. <laughs> All right, guys. I want to remind you that subscribing is the most important thing you can do right now. So click that little button, that like button, the subscribe button. Uh, that helps us to be able to get more amazing content and these amazing guests for you to be able to listen to. Just think of all the fun you wouldn't have had had you not subscribed because you would have missed out on this amazing interview with Justina Ireland. So yeah, make sure that you click the like and subscribe and go check out her work as well. There's all those links down there. We put them in the show notes. It's not just for practice. Go check out her stuff as well. So follow her on the socials because trust me, it's a hoot and uh, it's a it's a lot of fun. I really do dig her, her social media and um, yeah, I'm a fan. So anyway, yeah, go check those out. And thank you so much, Justina, for, for coming on the show today. Really appreciate your time. And guys, thank you for watching. That's going to be it for us on the FSF podcast. Goodbye. Copyright 2024 FSF podcast. Reference to any specific product or entity mentioned on this podcast does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by FSF podcast. The views expressed by guests are their own and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. If you have any questions about this disclaimer, please contact us via email at info at fsfpopcast.com.